If the moon was going to crash into Earth and destroy the entire planet, what would you do? I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the swarm in Moonfall. Planet Earth is going to be destroyed. This astronaut Brian is helping his colleague repair a space satellite when the power in their shuttle suddenly goes out. Surprised, the astronauts turn around and are shocked to discover that something is coming right towards them. Before they can do anything, it slams into the satellite and knocks the men loose, hurling them into space. Panicking, the astronaut notices his friend spinning out of control and reaches out to grab his hand, but the man is suddenly pulled away at the last second. His tether has been caught around a piece of the space shuttle, and there's nothing Brian can do to save his friend's life. It's horrifying, but the surviving astronaut makes his way back into the ship and finds the pilot knocked unconscious. Desperate, he tries to call his missing crewmate, but the man has gone silent, and he's completely on his own. Acting quickly, the astronaut manages to stabilize the space shuttle, but then he looks out the window and notices something strange. It looks like there's a cloud growing on the surface of the moon, and soon he'll find out that everything he knew about the universe was a lie. Ten years later, this nerd Casey is mopping the floor of a university, but nobody realizes he's not allowed to be here. As the last professor leaves his office to head home for the night, the nerd holds the door open and sneaks inside. He's been waiting to hack into the school's database and impersonates the professor, making a call to request information about the moon's orbit, but quickly hangs up when he hears someone approaching. The man leaves the building and heads for his night job where he works at a fast food chain, but as he's helping a customer, the man gets an email. The professor's colleague has just sent data of the moon's orbit and taking a look, Casey here realizes that this is about to change the world forever. He goes home and desperately tries to get in contact with NASA, but they refuse to take him seriously. It's frustrating. And with few options left, he begins printing out the data when he notices his cat peeing on his newspaper. He walks over to move the animal away, but that's when he discovers a headline where it reveals that Brian, the astronaut, will be speaking at a space museum today. And it gives the man an idea. Okay, this is not good. Casey here has just learned something terrifying about the moon's orbit, and will soon discover that in three weeks time, it's going to crash into the surface of the Earth. That means all life on this planet could be ending unless we do something before it's too late. But there's a problem. This guy has information that could save the planet, and nobody wants to take him seriously. But there's a very good reason for this. The truth is, everything we know about the moon goes completely against the idea that it will crash into the Earth. So it's not a surprise that NASA isn't picking up his calls. Now in real life, we actually have the opposite problem, because every year the moon is moving away from us by about 2 inches, but its orbit is so stable that it would take a 600 kilometer asteroid hitting the moon at 125,000 kilometers per hour to knock it out of orbit. The moon can't produce this much force on its own, and that's exactly why telling the scientific community that the moon is falling would be certifiably insane. Having said that, it's important to point out that if something like this did happen, it's very likely NASA would actually be the first to know. They literally have 17,000 people working for the agency, and the United States alone has over 6,000 professional astronomers who regularly contribute to scientific research. So Casey here is probably not the only person with this data. Now surprisingly, it's not difficult to contact NASA, especially if you have important information to share with them. The fact that this guy was smart enough to break into a college professor's computer but couldn't figure out how to find the contact page on NASA's website is ridiculous. He literally phoned a gift shop at the Kennedy Space Center and then gave up, but let's pretend he tried everything he could and still wasn't able to get through. If I was the only person in the world who had information that could save the planet, and nobody would listen, then we might have to do something pretty crazy to make sure we're impossible to ignore. That's why if I were this guy, and every rational option wasn't working, then as a last resort, I would strongly consider holding up a bank. It might sound extreme, and that's because it is. But he's already breaking several laws just to get this information, and if all life on Earth was at stake, then it might be worth the risk. I would make sure they knew my intentions were only to keep them here until they send these documents to NASA, and since it's a bank, the authorities will get involved. From there, we can demand NASA to look at the documents before releasing hostages, and once they do, they'll realize that we were right. As long as we don't have a weapon and nobody is hurt, then the public might even consider us a hero for putting ourselves in danger to help protect the human race. Just like you could be a hero by playing Monster Legends, who teamed up with The Walking Dead to celebrate the iconic show's return, creating six new monsters inspired by the heroes Rick, Daryl, Michonne, Negan, Carol, and Maggie. 
Monster Legends is an awesome free-to-play mobile game that features over a thousand collectible monsters. Build your own army of terrifying killers into a team that can survive any threat. These monsters can be bred to create new, even stronger species, building them up and forming a team to battle other monster masters. Not only that, the team at Monster Legends has joined forces with The Walking Dead to include monsters inspired by your favorite characters. Check out the Rick monster with his invincible machete and axe attacks and get the Daryl, Maggie, Rick, and Carol monsters as they become available in the game to automatically unlock the Negan monster, master the dungeon, and get the indestructible Michonne monster. For a limited time, use my link in the description or the QR code to receive a free starter pack of 20,000 food, 100,000 gold, 3 gems, and Mothman and start your journey to become the ultimate monster master today. Thank you to Monster Legends for sponsoring this video. The nerd drives over there as fast as he can and rushes inside, where he finds a class of young students. They think he's the astronaut that's supposed to be speaking here, and the man decides to teach them his theories about the moon while he waits. The nerd explains to them that it's actually a megastructure created by an ancient civilization, and the kids don't understand what he's talking about. But that's when the astronaut, Brian, walks in. The nerd approaches the man, introducing himself before asking to be put in contact with NASA. The astronaut explains that would be impossible, but Casey here insists they'll listen to him because he has evidence that the moon is falling out of orbit. It sounds unbelievable, and the man asks security to escort him off the premises, but just as the nerd is being taken away, he throws the documents on the ground, begging him to read them. Meanwhile, at NASA headquarters, the director has just found out that the moon is falling into an elliptical orbit. That means in three weeks, lunar debris will stop bombarding the Earth's surface before smashing straight into the planet. But that's not all. The man is shown a high-res image of the moon, and they all notice a a deep hole in the crater floor. It's a complete mystery, but everyone realizes they need to act fast before it's too late. This astronaut Jacinda suggests they should send a team to go check it out, but her boss thinks it's unrealistic. They don't have enough time for a safe launch, and to make matters worse, the terrifying news has already been leaked onto the internet. The world is going to freak out, and if they don't do something soon, the entire human race will be destroyed. Days later, people have started panicking, and now that they know it's the end of the world, cities are overrun with riot. With so much at stake, NASA has no choice but to launch a moon mission, but it'll take several days before the team arrives. Meanwhile, Brian here is watching a news report on the latest conspiracy theory that the moon is a megastructure, and suddenly remembers what the nerd, Casey, told him earlier. Wanting to find out more, the astronaut visits a hotel where the man is hosting a seminar and requests to talk to him in private. Curious, Brian here asks how he managed to figure out the moon was falling before NASA did, and the nerd explains that he's been doing research on megastructures for years. It's the only answer that makes sense of what's happening, and he believes that the moon's structure was built around a white dwarf to draw its energy, but something went wrong, and that's why it's steering off orbit. Okay, this is nonsense. Casey here thinks that the moon is actually a megastructure built around a dying star, but as exciting as it sounds, there's a major problem with this conspiracy. For someone who wants to be a scientist, he should have realized that white dwarf stars are extremely dense. What's interesting is that most of the time, these stars shrink to less than 1% of their original size, while keeping most of their mass. But that immediately destroys his entire theory. If the moon had a white dwarf star at its center, then based on its proximity to Earth, our planet would have to be orbiting the moon because it would have a much lighter mass. Now in celestial mechanics, if an Earth-sized planet orbits a white dwarf any closer than 640,000 kilometers away, then it would be torn apart by the gravitational pull. This is known as the Roche limit, but since the distance from the Earth to the moon is still within that range, we should definitely be getting pulled to shreds. Since this clearly hasn't happened, it's safe to assume that Casey here is wrong and there's no star inside of this moon. Having said that, we wouldn't want all that science to ruin a perfectly good movie, so we need to plan for the situation like our lives depended on it. If we know that the moon is three weeks away from impact, then the first thing it will affect are the ocean's tides. In only a few days, this could create waves as high as 10 to 20 meters, and that means places like Florida and even New York will be completely underwater, but it gets even worse. Over a billion people live on the Earth's coastlines, and once the tides change, it will be the largest migration the Earth has ever seen. So we need to be the first to leave before anyone realizes what's going on. Now you might think the smartest decision is to find the highest ground possible, but this would also be a mistake. When the moon's gravity pulls on the earth, it doesn't just pull in the water, but also on the atmosphere itself. This creates tides of breathable air, so if you're in a high elevation, then you won't have any oxygen because the atmosphere gets stretched thin. We also want to avoid staying on any fault lines because the moon's gravity will put more pressure on the tectonic plates, causing earthquakes and volcanic 
activity. Putting all this together, it basically means we're screwed no matter where we go. And with this in mind, the most logical solution is to rack up your credit card bills and buy yourself an underground bunker. These things are designed to withstand just about any natural disaster you can imagine, and as long as you're far enough inland, it's probably your best bet of surviving the apocalypse. The one problem here is that society has already started collapsing, so getting workers to help you move it, dig out the earth, and install a bunker is already highly unlikely. Everyone on the planet will be abandoning their jobs and prioritizing survival, so unless you're able to install it on your own in less than three weeks, it's not a viable option. This leaves you with only one other solution, and that's a co-ownership shelter like Vivos. It's already stocked with years of food and supplies and can fit up to 80 people inside. The cost of membership is pretty damn expensive, but soon there's not going to be a banking system at all. So I would buy out as many vacancies as my credit card will allow and drive my family across the country to hide safely until the rest of humanity is dead. Later, the astronauts have finally reached the moon, and the group begins to deploy a probe, launching it straight into the hole they discovered, but that's when something goes horribly wrong. They all watch as the probe stops descending and gets pushed back out of the crater by a mysterious force. Suddenly, a massive robotic tentacle rises up and heads straight for their space shuttle before attacking the astronauts inside. It's terrifying. And everyone in mission control can do nothing but watch as the creature murders their crew. Nobody realizes that this monster is an artificial intelligence that lives inside the moon, and it's dead set on exterminating the human race. Meanwhile, inside a hotel, this guy notices a news report about severe flooding across America, and when he looks outside, the man sees a massive tidal wave coming his way. Panicking, he runs into the diner where the astronaut is and warns the men that they're in danger. They all quickly leave the restaurant, but as Brian here takes a look outside, the man realizes they need to head back upstairs right now. He orders everyone to move to the highest floor, but that's when he notices that Casey has fallen behind. The force of the water is carrying him away, and to make matters worse, he doesn't know how to swim. Acting fast, the astronaut dives into the wreckage and grabs the guy, pulling him to safety at the last second. Upstairs, the survivors dry themselves off, and Casey asks him about the mysterious hole he saw on his final mission. The astronaut admits it's true, but his superiors had insisted it was just a meteor. They covered the whole thing up and it got the man fired, but soon, the truth will be exposed. Exhausted, the men try to get some sleep, but that night they're woken up by a spotlight shining into their room. The man gets up to open the door, and finds out that a squad of soldiers have come to extract him for a special mission, making it clear that it's a matter of national security. Obeying their orders, the men are taken to a government facility and detained, but are surprised to find an unexpected guest. Brian's ex-colleague Jacinta enters the holding cell, and he demands that she tell him what's going on. The woman takes them to a control center and shows them footage of the creature that attacked the space shuttle. According to their data, the moon was trying to correct its orbit when the alien life form retreated back into the crater. Casey here interrupts, suggesting it's proof the moon is actually a mega structure that's being controlled somehow, but the others ignore him. The woman makes it clear they'll need Brian's help flying a space shuttle up to investigate, and there's nobody else qualified for the job. NASA has just discovered that the alien life form can disable all electronics, and this astronaut here is the only person who's ever landed a spaceship without power. Okay, this is absurd. NASA has finally admitted that there's some kind of machine life form hiding inside of the moon, but their solution might be the worst idea I've ever heard. Right now, the human race is facing extinction, so the highest ranking government officials have decided that their best chance of survival is to find Brian here because 10 years ago he crashed a spaceship. It's incredibly stupid, and this alone is a good enough reason to lose faith in all of humanity. Now thankfully, we wouldn't have this problem in real life because NASA already has equipment that can investigate the moon for us, and it's called the the Gravity Recovery and Interior Laboratory, or GRAIL. These are two unmanned spacecraft that were sent to the moon in 2011 and designed to use gravitational field mapping of the moon to find out what its interior structure is like. The spacecraft orbited the moon 25 hours away from each other and observed their change in distance down to the micrometer to measure the moon's gravitational pull. This allowed scientists to map the substructure of the moon over 300 kilometers deep. We've had this technology for over a decade, and that means if NASA wanted to get a better understanding of what's going on inside the moon, they don't need Brian here to do it. Now, I'm not a rocket scientist, but based on NASA's own mission history, it would make a lot more sense to send another Grail mission with updated technology to get a map of the megastructure that might be hiding inside. We've already learned that the life form will disable any electronics that it finds, so we need to make sure that our spacecraft can shut off power instantly when any fast motion is detected. Then, if we can draw out the creature with an electronic distraction, this would give us the perfect opportunity to send a probe into the mysterious crater hole that 
the alien came out of. This probe would use LiDAR technology to help guide itself through the moon's center and reveal the interior of the megastructure before the life form rushes back inside to disable it. It might sound difficult, but space agencies have been running complicated missions for decades, and it doesn't take very much imagination to consider alternative ways to explore the problem instead of sending Brian here on a kamikaze rocket to the moon. Agreeing to help, Brian is taken to an abandoned rocket ship, and Jacinda explains that this is going to be their ride to the moon. It's the only shuttle they have that can get the job done without electronics, and they take it through town heading for the Vandenberg Air Force Base. Later, the ground crew is setting up for the launch when the military suddenly arrives with a nuclear bomb. They insist that a soldier will accompany the team to launch the warhead, and Brian explains the plan is to park the rover module with a nuke inside before turning on the electronics. This will lure the creature out of hiding and give them the opportunity to blow it up, but nobody realizes that this strategy is going to end in disaster. Suddenly, an earthquake hits the area, and it starts to rip apart the launch facility. Recovering from the aftershock, the nerd takes a look at the projected lunar orbit and realizes they've gone it wrong. The engineers forgot to account for the increased mass of the moon, and this one mistake could put the whole mission in jeopardy. Meanwhile, the others check on the shuttle and discover they're losing coolant, but don't have the supplies or manpower to fix it. Brian suggests they need to find more help, but they're down one engine, and now the ship won't be able to launch. The man leaves in frustration, and Jacinda here makes a terrifying announcement, declaring the mission to be a complete failure. Disappointed, she orders everyone to evacuate from the base, but as she's about to leave with her son, the woman notices that some people have stayed behind. One of them is KC, and he reveals that the gravity will only get stronger as the moon gets closer. They have to launch immediately if they want to save the planet, but the woman makes it clear that the mission has been cancelled. Suddenly, she spots something on the monitor and realizes they might have one last hope of succeeding. Approaching Brian, she tells the astronaut that if the moon's gravity is increasing, they might be able to launch the rocket without all their engines. He's the only one who could help them pull this off. But the man declines the offer, reminding her that his co-pilots have left. That's when the woman volunteers to come along, and Casey here insists he can set off the bomb, but they have to leave now or it'll be too late. The astronauts quickly suit up as the technicians get the shuttle ready for takeoff, but there's another problem. A huge tsunami is headed their way, and if they don't launch, they'll all drown to death. Okay, everyone involved in this mission should be fired. Right now, they're trying to use a space shuttle that was built 34 years ago and take it to the moon. This alone would be a horrible idea, but what makes it even worse is that they launched it within 24 hours of finding it in a museum. One of the most obvious problems with using the Endeavor here is that the shuttle has been retired for over a decade and most of the equipment has already been scrapped. There are no main engines, almost no propulsion system plumbing, and one of the fuel cells is missing. The ship also has a replica airlock and there isn't even a usable toilet installed. Finding and replacing all of these vital parts for a space mission in 24 hours is impossible, and even if the hardware issues could be solved, there's no longer any way to update the ship's software because the technology is too old. Now, it might seem like this was their only possible solution, but the truth is, using SpaceX Starship would probably be a better gamble. Even though it isn't tested for a trip to the moon, it has a much better chance of successful flight because it already has all the hardware and software it needs to get them into orbit. SpaceX has already been planning a mission to the moon for years, and one of its main roadblocks has actually been NASA's regulatory review, because they're worried it might put their infrastructure at risk. If the entire human species was on the brink of extinction, and NASA doesn't have any more rockets left to use, I think the government agencies would be willing to give Elon Musk his launch license to save the planet. With this in mind, it's not much of a stretch to think that SpaceX would actually be the most capable company to get this job done in short notice. All they need to do is make sure they're able to shut off all electrical components to avoid the alien life form. This will also shut off the life support system, but if the astronauts are using oxygen tanks, it should be possible to do for a short period of time. Now, as for launching themselves into a giant gravity wave, you might think that they should have seen this coming. The fact that nobody realized the danger until the wave was only a mile away from the shoreline is a complete failure. One huge problem is that since the moon's gravitational pull is getting closer to the Earth, it would have dragged all of our satellites out of orbit, but there are still landlines running below the ocean that carry 95% of the internet traffic. These cables carry data to terminals on land, but as long as they haven't been flooded, then they should still be working. If a 150-meter wave was traveling across the globe, somebody would notice. And even though tsunamis can travel at 
over 500 miles an hour, Hawaii would have still been able to alert the mainland when they saw the wave coming. Hawaii is almost 2,500 miles away from the Californian coast, and that means these people should have known about this wave five hours before it hit them. If we already know the moon is going to be causing larger waves the closer it gets, the first thing they should be doing is strengthening their communications networks to stay in touch with the rest of the world for as long as they can. That way, they can warn the public of a guaranteed natural disaster like this one. With no other options, the group is forced to take off, and the water quickly overtakes the shuttle, but they manage to make it out of the disaster zone just in time. They're finally on their way to the moon, but the odds are stacked against them. Brian tells the team that their ascent trajectory is off course, and the right booster is already losing thrust. They won't be able to make it off the planet, and could come crashing down to Earth any second now. As a last resort, the pilots decide to eject the boosters, hoping the moon's gravitational pull will save them from falling to their deaths. They barely make it past the Earth's atmosphere, and to everyone's relief, the man notices their velocity is increasing. The plan has worked, and the crew has narrowly escaped with their lives. Later, they set themselves up at a fueling station as Brian guides the nerd through the process, telling him to close the fueling valves. But that's when the man notices something behind Jacinda. Turning around, she watches the moon coming closer to their orbit, and its gravitational pull is ripping the Earth apart. It's a horrifying sight, but they get inside the shuttle and turn off the power to keep themselves safe from the alien life form. The woman does some calculations, and suggests they turn the engines back on for 43 seconds to make it to the moon. Powering on the thrusters, the group flies through an asteroid field and bumps into several of them, but that's when they hear a crash. Worried, they take a look outside and see the rudder has been ripped off. This mission is getting more dangerous by the minute, and they might not be going home anytime soon. They finally close in on the lunar surface, and Brian gets the lander ready. Climbing into this pod, he flies out of the shuttle and heads to the moon, carefully navigating around the asteroids. With the lander in position over the mysterious hole, he turns turns it on and returns back to the ship before arming the nuclear bomb, but that's when they see the giant creature come out of hiding. It's investigating the rover just like they planned, but suddenly the creature stops. The crew knows something is wrong, and begin to realize that it's coming straight for them. The astronaut figures out that the detonator must be producing an electrical signal and smashes it, hoping the monster will go away, but it's already starting to swallow their ship. Thinking quickly, he tells the nerd to shut off his phone, but the man is too slow, so he grabs it from him, breaking it against the bulkhead. With that, the mysterious life form quickly retreats and heads back into the moon's giant hole where it came from. Okay, this is freaky as hell. Despite all odds, their plan was about to work except for one small problem. Nobody stopped to realize that the remote control was an electrical device, so turning off all the power in their space shuttle was completely pointless. To make things worse, Casey forgot to turn off his phone, which alerted the monster, and these had to be the dumbest mistakes in the whole movie. It would have been a lot smarter to wait until the last second, and right before the monster starts to consume the rover, we can arm the nuclear bomb and explode it. Now, even though this plan appeared to be worse, working, it might be a lot less effective than anyone realizes. First of all, the creature looks like it's made from some kind of nanotechnology because it can break into small pieces and join itself together at will. An explosion might not be able to kill something that can already disintegrate itself, and since it's close to our Earth, it's a lot more likely that the nuclear explosion will cause more harm to us than anything else. As it just so happens, this wouldn't be the first time that a nuclear bomb was sent into outer space. In 1962, the US detonated a nuclear bomb 200 150 miles above the Pacific Ocean, resulting in an electromagnetic pulse causing full blackouts across Hawaii. It was 500 times more powerful than the bomb that fell on Hiroshima and created an artificial radiation belt across the planet that lingered for 10 years, destroying every satellite that flew through the area. It was a disaster, and if we take a lesson from history, we can expect that setting off this bomb will cause a full blackout directly below them. Even if it's just a small part of the globe, it's incredibly dangerous because there's a possibility the mechanical life form will fly down to Earth and start ravaging the planet. Without power, we would have no way to defend ourselves against the creature, and with that in mind, we clearly need a different strategy to attack this thing. The problem here is that if this creature can break itself down into particles, then the life form doesn't have a brain or heart that would give us a convenient way to kill it. It's a terrifying enemy, and that's why it makes a lot more sense to destroy the home instead of killing the creature. It's very likely that a life form this complex needs a lot of energy to sustain it, so whatever is giving this thing its power might 
might be coming from the megastructure inside of the moon. If Casey is right, and there's a white dwarf star in sight, then it's possible this life form needs it to stay alive, and the megastructure is the only thing that's capable of converting the sun's energy for the monster to use. That's why if it were me, instead of luring the creature to the nuclear bomb, I would lure the creature away so that we could send the bomb down into the center of the moon. Then, we can try destroying the equipment inside of the megastructure so the life form can't draw any more energy out of it. It's also worth pointing out that a nuclear explosion creates temperatures 10 times hotter than the core of the sun at about 200 million degrees Celsius. So even though the megastructure would be very durable, a nuclear explosion might still be enough to do some damage. If we're successful, then the creature will probably burn its energy reserves without any way to recharge itself and eventually die. The man figures out that the creature must be programmed to seek out electrical devices only if it's around organic matter. This discovery could help them save the human race, but there's a problem. The US military has secretly prepared more nuclear warheads to attack the creature with, and the fallout is going to kill millions of people. He refuses to let that happen, and decides he'll take the lander to chase after the creature himself. Shocked, his friend points out the US military will want to fire their missiles as soon as the moon gets into range, and KC reveals that this will happen in less than two hours. With no time to waste, the group flies down on the lander while while avoiding massive chunks of debris, moments before their shuttle blows up in flames. There's no turning back now, and the astronauts head into the moon to complete their mission. As they get deeper, Casey notices the material inside is changing form, and it's undeniable proof that this is the whole of a megastructure. Unable to see ahead, the astronaut has no choice but to turn on the lights, risking another attack. It's the only thing keeping them from crashing, but the life form at the center of the moon has just been alerted, and now it's going to hunt them down. They speed through the moon's depths until they find these giant metal rings that somehow must be stabilized in the megastructure. The lander continues exploring, when suddenly they spot the creature in the distance. The astronaut tells the others to prep the bomb inside the vehicle, and the man is on a course to crash into the monster when something hacks the vehicle. Luckily, they veer off target as the man tries steering them to safety, and this massive door opens up at the last second. That's when a beam of energy shoots out, pulling their ship straight into a hangar and saving them from certain death. Getting his bearings, Brian here wakes up but quickly notices that their oxygen levels are dangerously low. He rushes to grab his helmet but begins to black out, never seeing the airlock open before a strange green light scans their bodies. Later, the others wake up and notice that not only is the air breathable, but their pilot has disappeared. Leaving the shuttle, the crew find themselves inside a highly advanced structure, but the monster is still trying to break inside. That's when a door opens behind them, and Jacinda bravely decides to find out where it leads. They continue through the structure until until they discover their crewmate sitting in a beam of light. Relieved, they rush over to check on him, and the man reveals that he just had a vision explaining everything that was going on. From what he saw, the moon was actually created by ancient humans millions of years ago, but this robotic life form began exterminating them, and it's clear they need to destroy this thing or else it will eventually wipe out the human race. Okay, we've just learned that the moon was built by humans from an ancient civilization billions of years ago. I'm not gonna lie, that's actually pretty cool, but there's one serious problem here. This race of humans were so advanced that they could travel across galaxies and harvest energy from the stars, but for some reason, they couldn't defeat their own technology. A civilization as sophisticated as this should have built in safeguards to prevent their artificial intelligence from ever becoming this much of a threat, and at the very least, they would have perfected Asimov's three laws of robotics. The first law is that a robot must not harm a human or by inaction allow a human to come to harm. The second law is that a robot must obey any instruction given to it by a human. And the third law is that a robot must avoid actions or situations that could cause it to harm itself. This already provides a very good framework to help make sure a disaster like this wouldn't happen, but they never solve the problem. To make things worse, our ancestors now expect us to fix it for them billions of years later, but all we have is a broken spaceship and a nuclear bomb. It's a hopeless situation, but they should at least be grateful that this took place on the moon, because I can't imagine anything working out for the astronauts if all this was happening on the sun instead. The odds are stacked against them, but they should have realized there's a huge advantage they completely overlooked. Right now, Brian here is literally speaking with the operating system of the entire megastructure, which is great news because the program should know everything about this moon, including how to drive it. If we remember earlier, the scientists at NASA realized that the moon was in the process of correcting its orbit when the alien life form retreated back into the crater. That means this moon is still capable of flight, and since there's a white dwarf star inside, it would have had to travel at least eight and a half light years to get here in the first place. With this in mind, 
as long as the creature can't get through these doors, we should have time to ask the operating system to teach us how to drive the megastructure away from the Earth. What's exciting here is that if it's an alien spaceship that's already capable of intergalactic travel, then it should be able to move close to light speed as well. Since the alien is only here to attack the moon, then we can draw it away from the Earth and chase the megastructure across the galaxy, and even though the planet will be without a moon, the human species might still have a chance to survive. The downside is that without the moon's gravity pulling back, the Earth's axis will become unstable, and the ocean's tides will drop significantly. This would completely change the seasons and weather patterns of the planet, and probably cause some serious ecological issues. But that's a price I'm willing to pay to prevent all life on Earth from going extinct. They enter the hangar where they left the lander, and are surprised to discover that it's been fully repaired. As they strap themselves inside the ship, the astronaut explains that almost all of the moon's defense systems are down, but it still has an armada they can use to help weaken the creature. It's even upgraded the nuke in the back of the lander, and it means they might have one last chance to save their planet. The astronaut parks the vehicle in front of the hangar entrance and tries luring the swarm to lunge at him, but it's a trap. The creature is stopped at the last second, and the astronaut flies past it, forcing the monster to chase after them. He leads the lifeform close to a bunch of spaceships that fire their turrets and blast it into pieces. The monster pursues them relentlessly through the megastructure, but it gets trapped in a massive explosion and they manage to lose its trail. Heading into this tunnel, Brian explains his plan to destroy the creature once and for all, and tells them that he'll stay behind the rover to detonate the bomb, while the others take the ship out of the moon. The man reminds them that the monster is attracted to organic life in an electrical environment, and this is the only way to save them. Someone has to stay behind, and asks the nerd to go in the back of the rover so that he can warn them when the monster arrives. Brian stubbornly refuses to let anyone else sacrifice themselves, but that was his biggest mistake. Suddenly, the message on the monitor warns that the rear hatch has been opened, and the astronaut looks back to see Casey entering the rover. The man begs him to get out of there, but the nerd refuses. That's when the swarm reappears at the other end of the tunnel and heads straight for them. Casey quickly detaches from the lander module and gets left behind as the monster approaches, swallowing him whole. With the bomb primed to explode, it blows up and destroys the creature entirely. Jacinda gets into the driver's seat and maneuvers them out of the megastructure, managing to avoid being caught in the explosion. Later, Brian wakes up in the shuttle with no idea where he is, and walks outside to find the top half of the Chrysler building on a mountainside. He's made it back home on Earth after saving the world from total annihilation, and now they'll have a bunch of money to spend from all their insurance claims. But what do you think? How would you be Moonfall? Let me know with a comment down below. Thank you so much for watching, and thank you once again to Monster Legends. Definitely check them out using the link in the description for some awesome rewards, and have a damn good day.